And uh, I'm going to introduce our next s speakers. Oh. Hello. Hi, can you all please take a seat? <laughs> all right, so we are here for our second panel. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, OK. So my name is Stephanie Luce. I'm a professor here. Um, I'm a professor here at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. I'm a proud member of the Professional Staff Congress AFT, my fourth academic union, actually. Um, and so what we know, what we already started talking this morning and this afternoon, is that it's more than just organizing a new, uh, new unions. Workers also need to figure out how to win collective bargaining agreements. They have to win uh, strikes. And they have to think creatively about building new forms of organization and expanding the concepts of collective bargaining to reach um, all aspects of our lives. So our panel today, I'm not going to go through their bios. They're in the uh, program for you. We're going to start with uh, Sarita Gupta from the Ford Foundation and uh, moving down to Carlos Aramaya from Unite Here Local 26, Ben Wilkins, ben Wilkins from the Union of Southern Service Workers, Yadira Alvarez from, the, from Workers United SEIU, and Bob Master, former assistant uh, to CW D District 1 and uh, teaching here at CUNY SLU. Um, so thank you, and we're just going to get right into uh, our first speaker, Sarita Gupta. Hello. It's always hard to be the after lunch speaker, but let's see if we can do this. So let me see if I can get this set up. Um, what would I do? I can't see the screen. Sorry. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Well, first of all, thank you, Stephanie, for that um, for that uh, for that introduction. And it's been so great. I was here for the morning panel. What a terrific panel and set of discussions. And I'm really happy to be sharing the stage with others. So my talk today is based on the book that I co-authored with Erica Smiley, who is the executive director of Jobs with Justice, titled "The Future We Need: Building a Better Democracy in the 21st Century." And yes, I'm with the Ford Foundation, but actually Smiley and I wrote this book as part of our leadership transition. I was the former director of Jobs of Justice and worked with Jobs of Justice for many years. And we wrote this book really to document some of the innovations that we're seeing in approaches to collective bargaining across the workers' rights field as we supported and partnered with many unions, worker centers, and other organizing groups. There are three main points that we make in the book that I think are really critical to inform new approaches to building worker power and collective bargaining. The first is that collective bargaining must be expanded beyond workplaces to support a healthy political and economic multiracial democracy. The second is that collective bargaining needs to be modernized to meet the needs of today's workers. And thirdly, we must center race and gender in the worker movement because workers have complex intersectional identities and that is the only way we can win progress. And I think these were points early, made earlier by Tammy and is it Maite? Maite, thank you for the call out on the book and for what you uh, raised on the first panel. All of this, of course, is extremely relevant given the uptick of workers organizing and taking collective action today. So I'm going to just go deep on some of these points. So democracy is about the ability for people to govern over aspects of their lives. Democracy is not just a system of political practices. Democratic principles must also be applied to the participation and decision making in all aspects of our economic lives. While voting and lobbying and other forms of policy and legal work are important forms of democratic participation, collective bargaining both at work and elsewhere applies democratic practices to economic relationships. Without both political and economic democracy, the whole system is compromised. So collective bargaining is fundamental to democracy. And let's be clear, this is not a new idea. 
the Reconstruction era was the last time we attempted as a nation to build a multiracial democracy, politically and economically, in the US. And we saw that through the constitutional amendments that were made, to uh, the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery, the 14th to define citizenship, the 15th Amendment to define the vote. These are foundational elements of building democracy, and certainly the labor movement has been trying to make much of this real, and our opposition has been working really hard to roll this back. But the, we should be clear, the project of building a multiracial democracy has never brought to fruition, and now we must complete the job. So I'm actually, in the interest of time, gonna skip the maps and go to my second point, which is, about collective bargaining that needs to be modernized to meet the needs of today's workers. Business, finance, and the economy have transformed over the last century, all of which has eroded workers' rights and our public institutions. We need to forge new ways of organizing and bargaining appropriate to a world in which power is concentrating in the hands of fewer economic actors. So at its best, collective bargaining is a system by which working people can exercise collective power in a way that directly confronts the owners of capital and reclaims a portion of that capital um, for working people and their communities. Collective bargaining allows everyday people to practice democracy, directly engaging in the decisions that affect their lives. And workers have a stake in their ability to come together collectively, not only as employees, but also in the myriad of other ways working people interact in the economy as tenants, debtors, homeowners, and consumers. So we offer a new definition of collective bargaining. We have to expand our definition to be about creating pathways for working people to come together collectively to negotiate with any entity that has power over their lives, whether it's employers, landlords, financiers, and more. This approach of expanded bargaining ensures democratic practices are applied to all the ways workers interact with the economy. This helps us to recognize that collective bargaining is indeed a fundamental of democracy, okay. Um, now, I wanna be clear. There are still millions of workers who can access the form of collective bargaining that evolved over the course of the 20th century. This is critical, and I'm not at all suggesting that we should abandon this approach. But there are also millions more who cannot access this form of collective bargaining given the limitations of our laws. So there are three approaches to collective bargaining that shift the very nature of what a union contract covers, broadening what individuals can negotiate over and who they can negotiate with from their direct boss to the individuals with concentrated power in their sector or community. So the first approach I wanna lift up is bargaining for the common good. In this approach, unions have that have the right to bargain use contract fights as an opportunity to push through demands that not, not only benefit workers on the job, but also to work with local partners on demands that affect the wider community as a whole. Workers fight for rights, wages, and dignity on the job, even as they also push for structural changes that address their needs as renters, mortgage payers, student debt holders, or people of color whose communities suffer from structural racism. Take, for example, Florida Public Service Union, SEIU Local 8 which leveraged their power during contract negotiations to demand that the city and state stop providing subsidies to companies that rely on fossil fuels as a core component of their business model. This approach sees workers as whole people being impacted by many, many issues. Another example is the Minnesota Property Services Union, SCIU Local 26, who demanded a ban on the box for companies to remove any questions pertaining to a potential employee's criminal record from employment applications. And there are many other examples, Chicago Teachers Union, who through their contract negotiations were able to get supports and services for homeless students and families, and the list um, goes on. The second approach I wanna lift up is community-driven bargaining. So negotiating beyond the workplace. In this approach, 
Organizations are applying frameworks of bargaining to other economic relationships. In recent years, we've seen a real uptick in tenants unions and debtor organizations taking on big banks. So one example of this is the Crown Heights Tenants Union, which consists of tenants residing in a number of buildings in Brooklyn who have joined together to negotiate with corporate landlords. To get corporate landlords to negotiate, they're prepared to carry out a rent strike. The ultimate goal is not only si to sign collective bargaining agreements, but also to use such agreements in the fight against neighborhood gentrification, displacement, and other attacks on affordable housing. Another example I want to lift up is um, the Always Essential campaign, which is a movement to advance the pay, working conditions, and rights of essential workers. This coalition has advanced Essential Workers' Bill of Rights in cities across the country. But just, uh, I think it was last year or now, the campaign also established a Health and Safety Standards Board made up of essential workers in Harris County, Texas, the first of its kind in the nation. This Standards Board is a good example of ensuring that workers are at the table with policymakers and other stakeholders to shape the policies and the practices impacting essential workers in an ongoing way. The, the last approach I want to lift up is bargaining with the ultimate profiteer. In this approach, workers are bargaining with the real decision makers, the ultimate profiteers of global capitalism. And they're essentially expanding the frameworks for bargaining beyond employers. So if we take the example of uh, from, uh, this is actually in 2012, the National Guest Workers Alliance helped 11 Louisiana workers under contract with a small company named CJ Seafoods to obtain a meeting with their ultimate beneficiary of their labor, the retail giant Walmart. The Guest Workers Alliance acted big seeking to negotiate directly with the people at the far end of the supply chain, the food supply chain, and they actually won. This now brings me to the last point I raised earlier, going back to the themes of our book, which is about centering race and gender. An integrated strategy to address white supremacy and patriarchy is not just a moral stance, but it is also a power stance. In 2021, Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama, mostly black, called for help in their bid to form a union with RWDSU, as we heard on the panel earlier. Many workers shared how radicalized they were after the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota by former police officers, after having participated in the 2020 summer uprisings for racial justice, it gave them the courage to speak out about their own conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we heard, their union election is still too close to call. During that same week, as we all know very well, the Amazon labor union was also able to win, uh, was able to win their union. And that was also because people were radicalized by racial injustice after Chris Smalls and others were arrested and fired in the early days of the pandemic for demanding better COVID protections. You contrast these victories with the setbacks experienced by two unions in 2017 after attempting to win union elections without centering race. Both the UAW's attempts to organize workers at the predominantly black Nissan facility in Canton, Mississippi, and the machinists union's attempt to organize workers at Boeing's Charleston, South Carolina facility did little to emphasize how both companies recognized their unions um, when workers formed in other locations that were not majority black, focusing instead on traditional issues of wages and corporate greed. And in both cases, we lost, and it wasn't close. Workers active in today's struggle are winning because they center race and gender, and the experiences of exploitation they've experienced because of it. That is why workers are activated and why we're making progress. So I actually want to talk a bit about gender, and then I'll wrap. Centering gender in the work of the labor movement is also key. 
we can no longer treat issues that have historically been seen as women's issues as side issues, but central to how we better the lives of all workers. Issues of equal pay and paid leave, childcare, elder care supports, gender-based violence and harassment in the workplace. Winning on these issues actually benefit all workers. We saw it with the National Women's Soccer League. They won childcare support, and guess what? The ma male players won it too, right? I mean, it's a small but real example. But I'm going to give you a bigger example of this. So uh, the efforts of garment workers who formed a multi-country committee to combat gender-based violence in the industry, um, it, the example is how they focused race, gender, caste, and used that as a way to help the union to the collective bargaining table where they hadn't otherwise been successful. So the story behind this campaign was in India, a woman had been harassed and violated for months. When she stood up to her manager, she was killed. The Women's Committee had formed and crafted a campaign focused on the brands that the factories supply for to bring attention to gender-based violence um, and force the brands to pressure the factories to address this issue. Just last year, they won a major victory. The Tamil Nadu Textile and Common Labor Union, the Asia Floor Wage Alliance, the Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum all announced the Dedingal uh, Agreement to eliminate gender-based violence and harassment, which includes a set of enforceable agreements with major fast fashion brands, H&M and Eastman Exports, one of the largest garment producers in India, covering multiple factories and two spinning mills, this agreement enshrines protections for 5,000 garment workers and provides a model for change industry-wide. What's important to note here is that the issues of gender-based violence and harassment in the factories and in the workplaces was not something that had been negotiated or addressed or could be brought to the collective bargaining table. Therefore, having a campaign that was organized by a group of women workers was key to advance when the fight was taken to the ultimate profiteers, to the brands. This was not in lieu of traditional approaches of organizing workers in the factories, but in addition to. So when we center gender and caste in this case, it opened up new pathways to victory for these workers. So I'm just going to conclude by saying, um, in our book, Smiley and I actually profiled many worker leaders, 12 in, in fact, that are on the cover of our book, a few of them are on the cover, but we really went deep and we li really listened. And for me, it was so heartfelt because there were some leaders that I had worked with on campaigns, but had never had the opportunity to just learn about their life and what they were thinking. And so what I want to say is that experience of really hearing from worker leaders, not as people who are just telling telling me what was wrong, but telling me how they thought about strategy and why they took the risks they took helped me understand that our movement must tend to the fundamental work of revitalizing our democracy. Because working people can't improve their lives without governing, like, and, if, like, and garnering like, and building an effective collective voice and shaping their world on and off the job. Workers are very clear. Every single one of them told us, this is fundamentally about dignity, agency, and it's about having joy in their lives. And I'll leave it at that. Good afternoon. Um, folks hear me? Well, first of all, uh, thanks uh, for the invitation uh, to come here. Uh, I'm Carlos Adamayo. I'm the president of Unite Here Local 26 uh, in Boston. We represent about a little over 12,000 uh, folks in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, we're a multiracial union, uh, majority women, uh, majority folks born outside of the United States. So, uh, but what I'm going to do today is actually talk about strikes. Uh, and I'm going to talk about my own experience uh, uh, on strike myself and on strike with our local. Um, and, you know, hopefully that will be useful uh, for some discussion about how strikes can be effective and how strikes can't be effective. So a little bit about me. So I have been uh, involved in 12 strikes. Um, uh, once I was on strike myself, once I was locked out myself. 
Uh, and five of those strikes were open-ended. In other words, we walked out with uh, no intention of walking back in without a contract. Uh, and six of them were what I like to call walkouts or job actions. They were limited in, d in duration. So the boss knew that we were going to go back in, right? Um, and I think those are two distinct ways people have used strikes uh, in the last little bit. And so, and I've also had many, many, many near misses, uh, many campaigns that have come to the verge of going on strike. Most recently at Northeastern University, uh, we were on the eve of going on strike and at four in the morning, we settled a contract that got folks $9.32 over four years, um, was an incredible agreement. Um, so strikes do work, um, but strikes are also hard. And so what I want to do is I want to talk, talk a little bit about why strikes are both hard but also fun. Uh, number two, I'm going to talk about some examples I know of in my own experience that did not work. <laughs> and then I'm going to, number three, going to talk about some things that did work. And then if I got time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about what did that do to our organization? Because there's some ups and downs, I'd say. Um, so first of all, on strikes, they are really fun. It is really awesome to walk off the job. Uh, I remember at Harvard University, when we walked out the dining halls, I remember this guy Dennis rolling up uh, with his drop top down, with Don't Stop Believing blaring at five in the morning, uh, with his sign running down the street in front of Annenberg uh, about how you know we're going to take Harvard down because we're on strike. Uh, I remember uh, when we were on strike at Marriott uh, for 49 days. Uh, I remember we were at bargaining in the middle of the strike, and this uh, room attendant, May, got up and made this really long and passionate speech in uh, Cantonese. Uh, it was not translated, and everybody who was there at bargaining completely lost it. Uh, and, and later, I was told by the Marriott's chief bargainer that that was the moment that he knew they were probably going to have to settle on our terms. Um, so they can be really incredible, right? And the sort of romance around strikes, like myself having walked out, like it's real, right? It feels really great to, to, to leave your employer behind, give them the finger, right? It's a little bit of giving them the finger uh, and saying, hey, I'm not walking back in, especially if it's open-ended. Hey, I'm not walking back in until it's done, right? But that said, strikes are also really, really, really difficult. And I wanna talk about a couple reasons why that is. First of all, I think strikes, and look, let's be honest, they're really scary, right? And they're really scary to organize, and they're really scary when you're out on strike. My own experience, when I was locked out uh, at Yale University, uh, I was personally threatened in an email by the dean of the graduate school and the faculty member I was teaching for, with that if I did not return to the classroom, uh, because I was respecting the picket lines of Local 34 and 35 at the time, that I would be brought up in disciplinary charges by the university, right? I was sitting by myself, right, in my, my little room on Howe Street, uh, and I get this email in the middle of the night, and it was really only, because I was teaching for, uh, I'm not going to say any names, but a kind of anti-union guy, it was really only me and one other person who were saying we weren't going to cross the picket line, and so... I didn't really know what to do, and there was that moment where like, I was a union guy, and I seriously was like, well, I guess I gotta do the thing that I don't wanna do. Now, the good thing is I picked up the phone, I called the other person who was refusing to do it, I called my organizer and walked it through, I took a stand, and you know, thank God, water under the bridge, nothing bad happened to me. But I personally have felt that moment, right? And every worker who chooses to go on strike feels that moment in one way or another, whether it's from the boss, whether it's from their coworker, whether it's from their family members, right? Family members who are saying, what do you mean you're gonna walk out on strike? Like, I rely on you to bring home <laughs> a paycheck every week so that we can pay for our kids to, you know, live. Uh, so those moments of fear are tangible and the boss uses those moments of fear and the boss also uses those moments of fear to convince folks that striking won't work. And I think that's the second thing that makes striking hard. There is a culture that striking does not work. And look, we can say, does that historically go back to Patco and Reagan and blah, 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 I don't know. But look, there is a culture that folks think striking doesn't work. And it's especially true in the industries that we represent and unite here in Local 26. Why? Because to be honest, when we walk out on strike in a hotel, it does not shut down. 
when we walk on, on strike in Harvard, Harvard continues to reproduce class power, which I think is what they do, right? Um, the business continues. It's not that hard to run a hotel with strike breakers, right? Because you just stop cleaning the rooms every day, you shut down the, the restaurant, tell people to go down the street, and you have the managers check people in, right? The same when we went on strike at Harvard. They kept some of the dining halls open, they kept some of them not open, but they just gave money to, to kids to go buy stuff, right? So uh, it, it is ingrained in at least our industry sometimes that, hey, you walk out, you're not you know, ending the means of production or whatever we're trying to do, uh, that, uh, that it's going to keep happening and they're going to wait you out. And that's another way in which I think fear makes striking really hard. And then um, the last thing I'd say is once you're out on strike, um, and we've had, some, we've had some long strikes in Local 26, uh, keeping people out on strike if victory isn't immediate is very, very challenging, right? No matter what you tell anyone before you walk out on strike, including Dennis with his sign, uh, and don't stop believing, people believe that when they walk out, the boss will see the light, come to the table, and settle on our terms. And a lot of times, that's not what happened. And the boss will use the fact that they can hold people out there and say, yeah, you're going to suffer, right, to win concessions in the bargaining. Um, and so one of the strategies we got to figure out is how do you keep people supported when they're out on strike? Um, so I think that's what's hard about it. Uh, you know, in my experience, what doesn't work? Uh, Stuff that doesn't work, <laughs> and this is strikes that I've been in that didn't work. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. Grad teachers, 2003, uh, New Haven at Yale. Uh, go on strike and hold an election after you go on strike. You will lose that election. Uh, <laughs> uh, and why will you lose that election? And look, it's not a laughing matter. What happened when we went on strike is, honestly, if we had gone on strike with 90% of the teaching assistants and research assistants participating in that strike, I think we would have won that election. We probably would have lost some support, but we would have won that election. We walked on strike with about 60%, maybe 55%. Um, and what happened when we were out on strike? The boss, the faculty, really, at Yale, but the fa sorry, not all the faculty, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it was a captive audience for the folks who were not on the picket lines. So literally, people were told every day, you're doing the right thing, and those people out there are crazy. And then for our folks who walked back in off of those strike lines, they walked into an environment where everyone who had stayed there had been favored by their boss, and they were the crazy people who were out there standing around with a sign, right? And it demoralized the people who had walked out, walked out on strike. So much so that when we walked into that election, we walked into the election with a public petition with 65% of the folks signed a public petition saying when they were going to vote on strike. It was over 1,200 people. Only 600-something people voted, right? Because there was a massive sense of demobilization, because the strike had happened, but uh, the experience people had was that it wasn't successful, and the experience of people who were against the union had was that they should be emboldened to beat down folks who were in favor of the union, right? Another piece of what happened in that failed strike, to be honest, and I'm to be blamed because I was one of the worker leaders in that campaign, is us in the leadership, we had a totally revolutionary transformative experience. We thought we were the coolest thing since sliced bread. And we sat down and said, of course, we're, the momentum is with us. We are definitely going to win. The victory is on the horizon, even though it took 20 more years. Victory is on the horizon. Uh, charge. And we didn't analyze, because the strike had that emotion, that emotional sort of romantic feeling, right? We did not actually look at the numbers and analyze what's actually going to happen when you go do that vote, right? And I think that was a real challenge and a real mistake. The other thing I think that's challenging that doesn't work is um, if there's too much focus on the idea of shutting it down, right? And we faced this challenge when we were on strike at seven Marriott hotels um, back in 2018, uh, we're at the Ritz. We're at the Ritz Hotel. They were, the workers there were so convinced that if they shut the Ritz down, that that would win the strike because it was the signature Marriott property in Boston. Well, lo and behold, the Ritz definitely did not shut down, right? There were some fun picket lines when the Yankees crossed our picket line. Uh, we called them all scabs. But at the end of the day, 
the Ritz didn't shut down. And what that did is it demoralized the Ritz workers and many of them crossed back over, not a majority, but many of them crossed back over after the first little bit of the strike. So those are some things that, from my experience, didn't work. Um, what does work? Well, a lot of the stuff folks have already talked about today, right? Broad, democratic organization, get people invested in the campaign, bring people to bargaining, like all that stuff that I know we talk about. That makes a huge, huge difference. And definitely, when we struck Marriott and won a really incredible agreement, we had that, right? We had, you know, 1,500 people on strike, when we were on strike during bargaining, like 700 people showing up to bargain, right? Massive, massive inv involvement uh, in the campaign. Um, I think the other thing that's important, at least for our industry, look, and I don't want to speak for other industries, is you've got to get folks to understand the strike is in the context of a much more comprehensive campaign that you're putting out there, right? So for example, in the Marriott strike, we reached out to customers. We had a whole group of people reaching out to customers. We had folks who went to visit investors, ownership groups of like, we had strikers go out to talk to ownership groups. We had folks um, you know, doing all kinds of stuff with the press, all kinds of stuff on social media, everything we possibly could to create a sense of chaos for the company. And part of what we were trying to do was actually cause a sense of ungovernability for the institution that was Marriott, because we knew even with the many, many, many hotels we had on strike around the country, it was a very small percentage of that whole company. So that sense of lack of governance and chaos, that was the goal. The strike was a piece of it, but there were many other things going on. The other thing that I think that's really important that works is you have to support people who are on strike. I know a lot of times folks all the service model, and uh, yeah, there's problems, but listen, Folks need to get strike support. Folks need to get money as strike support. They need to get food. They need to get help with talking to their lenders. All of this stuff, you need to build a significant infrastructure, especially if a lot of people on strike, to help them out. Because with folks in our industries who are living paycheck to paycheck, one week of striking, they're freaking out about how to make ends meet. And if the union is not there to support them, it will be seen as the union's failure. Um, and so, yes, that's not romantic, right? Sitting there for hours on end trying to help people with their lenders is not romantic. But it is what keeps people out on the line. So those are some things that work. The last thing I'll say and then close is, you know, I was asked before to say a couple words about what's the or it, it, how does it impact an organization to go on strike? And to be honest, it, 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 it's mixed. My experience is it's mixed, right? Even strikes you win because it's such an intense conflict. We were on strike for 90-something days at this hotel in Boston. It was, and we were on strike with 97% the whole time, and we won. We got a great agreement at the end of it, but it was so emotionally challenging for our committee and for the folks who were in there that they are still scarred from it to this day four or five years later, right? Um, I think they would all say they'd do it again because we won, but it really, really can be challenging in terms of carrying forward the organizing afterwards. But it can also have a really amazing effect to take groups of workers who I think didn't believe that they could do stuff, like our folks at Harvard, um, and see that they can do it, see that they can win, especially against these sort of global multi-billion dollar corporations. So thanks. So uh, my name is Ben Wilkins. I'm uh, the director of the Union of Southern Service Workers. Talk louder. Okay. <laughs> Stephanie in her email said I had 15 minutes, and uh, anybody who knows me knows that I have literally never talked for 15 minutes at the same time, like, <laughs> in my life. So I'm not going to last 15 minutes. But um, I want to talk a little bit about what our union does, how it organizes, and Keith talked last night and kind of stole my shine a little bit, to be totally honest, but, uh, <laughs> but I wanted to deepen some of the points that Keith made and to really talk about you know, how we organize in, in the context of the unique challenges that Southern workers face. So 
The Union of Southern Service Workers was founded in November of last year uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, we chose Columbia for a specific reason. Number one, it's where we have an incredible group of worker activists. But number two, because South Carolina is the lowest union density state in the country. Um, and I think that really informs the way that we've organized. And the, the union emerges out of 10 years of organizing through Raise Up the South, as we were formerly called, which is part of the Fight for 15 in a Union movement. Um, and last night, Mark from UE, who I don't know if he's in here, but he said, you know, the great historic challenge of labor is to organize the South. And that's the challenge that we're trying to confront. We want to be a part of the answer. We obviously cannot be the whole answer, but, but our belief is that to build a, a multiracial movement of workers in the South, especially the Deep South, especially the, the Black Belt South, the Black-led multiracial workers movement, can really fundamentally change this whole country. And so I'm going to talk about just a few things. One, what are the barriers to Southern organizing that form the backdrop of our strategy? Two, what is our organizing model? How do we confront those barriers? And then three, I actually want to talk a little bit about the role of popular education in our work, because I think it's really fundamental to, to what we do. So the barriers to, to organizing, what are Southern workers up against? I think it's pretty clear. I think most folks generally have a sense what Southern workers are facing, but I think it's worth stating. So there's, there's really three things. One is the total opposition of the state to the union, the total opposition of the state. Anti-union electeds hold super majorities in pretty much every Southern state legislature. They did not in North Carolina, uh, where I live, until a few weeks ago, and, and now they do. Uh, and in South Carolina, they do. And I actually am not a political person, so I can't tick off every state legislature, but in pretty much all of them. And that's a historic phenomenon, you know, obviously going back to the founding of this country and the, the role of um, slaveholders in constituting political power in this country. But to be more modern about it, going back to the post-war period when right-to-work laws were passed and really Southern legislators were at the forefront of that drive. And so large swaths of Southern workers have been excluded from trade union legality, from union rights, um, especially in the industries that we're organizing, especially low-wage workers, especially black workers. So that's barrier number one. Number two, and this is really obvious, but I think it's kind of important to state, is union density is really, really low. There are very few workers who are in a union. In South Carolina, it's 1.7%. The labor movement in South Carolina is incredible, but very small. It's basically the dock workers, a couple steel workers, locals. I think UPS might have a local. There's, there's like a very small labor movement in the South. And you can knock doors all day long in a working class neighborhood and not talk to a single union member. I think it's a critical piece to understand. And it's very common for, I think, uh, Jennifer Abruzzo mentioned that Chris Smalls said, you know, convincing workers they had a right to form a union was key in their organizing. And, and for us, one of the first conversations that our members have with their coworkers is, it is not illegal to be a part of a union. That's a very common notion. And it's obviously not true. You have the right to be a part of a union, but there's a deeper truth to that idea that Southern workers have. Because in point of fact, it is largely impossible to be a part of a union in the South. And so they're not really wrong to have that notion on a certain level. And employers are really hostile to unions. We all know that in the South, everywhere, especially in the South. And then the third thing is not unique to the South, uh, but bears mentioning too, it's the way that work is organized in the low wage service sector. In places like fast food, dollar stores, gas stations, home health care, the industry is really, industries are really built intentionally on a high turnover model. They don't want workers to stay in the job for very long. And so basically what they do is employers across the board recruit from a very large pool of low wage labor, available labor. Workers shift from jobs to job. Turnover in fast food is about 150% every year. Folks may have four or five, six jobs in the course of a year and may hold three jobs at any one time. So organizing in a traditional way, unit by unit, worksite by worksite, in a dollar store when there's three workers there is not a way to build power, in my opinion. So there's thus no straight line to union organization in the traditional sense. So what we have to imagine is a long-term strategy for power building and creative tactics in the here and now 
uh, to build union organization. And then I just want to say one other thing before I get to my next set of points, which is that I think there's a misconception about Southern workers oftentimes that Southern workers are more anti-union than workers across the rest of the country. And I actually think that is not true at all in my experience. I think Southern workers are ready for the union, want to form unions, want to build power, actually have led the most powerful worker movement in this country, radical reconstruction, and are waiting for organization and are ready to build organization. And that's what we believe and that's what we've seen. All right, so how do we organize? So our, our union is really organized to address these challenges. Um, first rule of how we define a union is that we don't let the boss define it for us. We simply define it as a group of workers coming together to build power, to make things better. That's, that's what a union is. That's what we're building. And centrally what we're doing is organizing the low wage service pool, service labor pool across geographies, places like Columbia, South Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, and organizing workers to confront the power of employers across the spectrum. And there's really three basic functions to how we organize. One is worksite organizing through direct action. Not doing NLRB elections, not going through traditional means because that's pretty much impossible for our group of workers. I think tactically the labor movement has to be diverse, has to approach things in a lot of different ways. For us, what makes sense is direct action. And that means everything we're talking about up here, um, forming committees, identifying widely, deeply felt issues, going on strike, everything that we know workers can do to build power. And then second is really what um, Reverend Nelson Johnson, who's a key ally of ours in North Carolina, calls community unionism, which is kind of what Sarita talked about, abolishing this distinction between community and work. How do you build power across workers' lives? And then the third thing, which I think is really key to what we do and, and what I'll, I'll end with is the cultivation of worker leaders. And, and we do that through popular education. So folks have probably heard of the Highlander Center, the Highlander Folk School. There's a tradition of popular education in the South, specifically in the workers' movement in the South. And, and we seize on that tradition and, and, and make it central to the work that we do. We define popular education as a participatory process using workers' own experiences to analyze the world and create strategies for change. So to this end, everything we do is popular education. Every organizing conversation, every social media post, follow us on TikTok, follow us on Instagram. We're constantly engaging in pedagogical processes to build the protagonism of, of Southern workers. Um, we have education retreats. We really place a, a heavy focus on popular education. And, and the reason for that, I think, is because unions are central to the fight for democracy. We've talked about democracy a lot uh, over the last couple of days. And I mean, I'm, I'm saying the same thing Sarita said earlier, but I think democracy is about more than voting. It's about, it's about protagonism. It's about workers being a part of the decision making that impacts their lives. And really, at the end of the day, that's the only thing that can build power for workers, and that's what the Union of uh, Southern Service Workers is all about, and I'm looking forward to talking to everybody about it more. Thanks. Thank you. Can we get to the first contract? That is the question. As you all know, as you all know, um, there has been an increase in people in, in workers wanting union and finding petitions to have unions represent them. But the point of all of that is to actually get to a contract, right? So can we get there is the question. Mm, if I can make this work. So my name is Jadira Alvarez, and I am the Chief of Staff of the Laundry Distribution Food Service Joint Board, Workers United, SEIU, and I'm the lead negotiator for the Starbucks Union stores in New Jersey and Connecticut. <laughs> Oops, there we go. 
So this is a big question. First contracts, how do we get there? So there was a study done by Robert Combs from the Bloomberg Law, and he had 391 first contracts. And out of those, 53 took two years or more to be ratified. 53 took two or more years. We know that after the first year, it gets extremely hard. And this figure does not include any folks that voted for their union, went through the whole process of getting everybody on board, voted to then not be able to ratify a contract. And so many employers use the negotiation process as a second election to push back, to make sure they delay, to create chaos, to make sure that workers don't get to the point where they actually get a contract. The whole point is to get a contract, and we don't get there a lot of times. So it's important for us to, as organizers, to also recognize some of these anti-union tactics that they use when they are, when we're in the process of negotiating a contract, right? We know that after the first year, right, they can decertify the union, so it makes it even that much harder. But a lot of companies do captive audience meetings, right, in the process of negotiating a contract. They do, they fire workers, right? They're gonna close the store. All the work is gonna go someplace else, right? They're all different type of tactics and it's important as organizers that we recognize that. They create chaos, right? Um, they say it's the union's fault. All of these things is important for us to, to recognize so that we are ready when to speak to workers about it. So the question is, there we go. So Workers United Starbucks contract campaign, how are we doing? We do not have a contract, right? We still do not have a contract. So the Buffalo Starbucks partner voted their union in on December 9th of 2021 we do not have a union contract. However, from 2021 to now, we have over 305 corporate stores. So the movement continues to grow. Partners, and what I call partners are workers, Starbucks partners, want to get to that contract. And so they're continuing to grow their movement. So yes, we can do it. Si sí se puede. Okay, so what does that negotiation look like? So the union created the National Bargaining Committee, and this committee is members, is partners from all over the nation, from their region, from their store, and they meet on a regular basis. They've created the proposals. They have um, shared it with their coworkers. They have done surveys, Zoom calls, meetings, to get input from other partners at the store. And then they draft language, they bring it back to them. Many partners have other suggestions, and so they revised it. This has been a very transparent process that the partners themselves have created. And so I was gonna show a video, but it doesn't <laughs> it's not working. But the video is a, a tweet, please follow us at Starbucks Workers United, and it has the members, the Starbucks partners, explaining the process to other partners. So they use all types of media communications from TikTok to Twitter to get the message out and to get feedback on these proposals. Then after that, we went to the table, store by store, unfortunately, store by store, each joint board, Workers United is divided by joint boards. Each joint board set up a table. The partners from that store will come. They have their proposals ready. They're ready to negotiate. And what does Starbucks do? They walk away. They refuse to bargain. At these bargaining tables, we have our Zoom, our members from the National Bargaining Committee on Zoom. As soon as we open the Zoom screen, Starbucks walks away. 
That is not right. If we do it in person, Starbucks walks away. They refuse, refuse to bargain. Oh, and this is the graphic that a lot of our partners put together to educate. So this is negotiation store by store. We have the Connecticut Vernon. We have um, Montclair that did it on Valentine's Day and gave the company a big um, Valentine's Day card. And the one on the left is Hopewell, New Jersey. And we have a quote from one of the partners in, in Montclair that says, we, we prepared to bargain at the table. The company set a little puppet, puppet with a, no authority to negotiate. If we, it is frustrating, we are ready, we are prepared, and they just refuse to bargain with us. We are not going back down. We are not going to step down. We are going to continue to fight until we have an, a contract, a union contract. And that was James Cruz from the Montclair store. So there's about these committees, like the National Bargaining Committee. There's 10 other committees. And these committees of partners do every aspect, plan every aspect. If there's a strike, they plan the strike. So this is not the union staff, this is the partners themselves. And that's part of the success of the Starbucks, is that the union has gotten out of the way to let the partners really own their campaign, the strategic decisions. They're making those. And so one of the things you see here are also the logos. Each store creates their own logo. That's amazing. The first logo is from New Jersey. The second logo is from Vernon, Connecticut. The worker that did this, lo this, this logo was fired, and we're fighting to get the person back to work. The flyer was also made by Naya at the end, where after they, they planned their strike, they planned the after party, <laughs> and they had Many of the Starbucks partners at that after party actually um, perform at a local brewery. And this is how we really build community and we really build the partners really leading the movement themselves. Um, in this slide, we also have the strike for Red Cup Day. And we just had an action in the New York City headquarters where New York partners and New Jersey partners walked in to the New York City um, Starbucks headquarters and gave them their proposals. Since they won't take them at the table, we're coming to them everywhere they are to provide our proposals because it is time for them to negotiate. So what does it take to win a contract? So yes, we need the National Labor Relations Board. They, you know, there's a whole debate whether they're helpful or not. They are helpful, but <laughs> we need a lot more, <laughs> right? Um, 10J injunctions are hard to get. As you know, in Starbucks, we're, we're almost there, right? But they're hard to get. What we really need is binding arbitration, right? They have it in some places, some providence in Canada is part of the PRO Act. Once workers decide that they want a union, there should be time limits of when to negotiate. And if that negotiation's not going well, then they should have the right to go to a mediator. And if the mediator is not, is, doesn't solve it, then we should have a binding arbitration. That is where we need to get to. Not every campaign is a, is a huge campaign, right? We have workers organizing in all types of industries, small and big, and we need to be able to get to the first contract before the first year. Now, as Edgar Romney says, the Secretary Treasurer of Workers United, it's our job to be prepared. So when we're negotiating a contract, it's important for us to know the industry, the financial outlook of the company, the economy, how it's affecting, are wages rising, are wages lowering, what is going on, are there regulations, are there, are there how can politicians help, are there other angles? It's important for us to do our homework. 
And the most important part, we can never beat Starbucks when it comes to money, right? They have an endless amount of pit of money. But what we have is worker power. We have community power. We have custom, custom power, right? We just need to get out the way so that they can lead the work. All of this work, all of this capacity wouldn't have been done if it wasn't because Workers United got out the way and let the partners themselves create the TikTok. I'm not creating no TikTok, <laughs> right? Create all of these things that we would only imagine. And so as unions, it's important for us to get out the way and really give workers the tools for them to go to the next level, for them to use their natural resources, their natural community to organize and to fight back. And that's the way we will win. And lastly, I wanna say it's a global movement. We can no longer be national or regional. Um, one third of the stores in Chile, of the Starbucks stores are organized. 450 in New Zealand. So this is the type of game. We as unions have to be able to talk to other unions, have to be able to support each other's movements whether in the United States, whether it's abroad, wherever we are, we are all workers. And so we have to start making sure that we actually do that. Um, so can we get to a contract? Yes, we can. And yes, we will. We will get there. So before I close, I just want to say thank you to all the Starbucks partners, whether you're in the union or not. We know that we will all get there. We will all be unionized. And if it wasn't for the Starbucks partners and then them actually taking the lead and owning this, we wouldn't be here. So the first thanks is always to the Starbucks partners. But also Workers United, um, you know, organizers as all of you are, it takes us a lot of sweat and tears to organize workers. And so I want to thank all our Workers United Joint Board staff and organizers. So thank you. Okay, great. Um, batting cleanup here. Um, it's really an honor to be here with uh, all these wonderful trade unionists. Um, I feel like um, I'm kind of going to give the CWA version of Carlos's talk. You know, it's like uh, our perspective on what it took to strike and what it took su to succeed. Um, I want to begin with a few opening remarks, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to stipulate that uh, we don't really have to debate that strikes are good for workers and good for the labor movement, and that the staggering decline in strikes uh, since 1981 is both a major symptom um, and an important cause of the decline of the labor movement. Uh, when we don't strike, we don't win. The other thing I do want to say uh, before delving into the question of what it will take to revive the strike is that strikes are at least as important uh, to the internal vibrancy and effectiveness of a union as they are an effective weapon against the boss. The strike is the only activity undertaken by a union in which the leadership, the entire organization, must know exactly where every single member stands. You are either on the picket line or you're a scab. No legislative campaign, no political campaign, no contract campaign without a strike um, requires the union to be systematically in touch with every single member. Likewise, the strike requires every worker to make a choice. I'm with the union or I'm with the boss. I'm on the side of the workers or I'm on the side of corporate power. So unions that do strike on a regular basis are healthier, more participatory, more democratic organizations. Strikes don't magically resolve all the problems of unions, nor do they turn members into radical activists, but they make for much better unions. Now, we are clearly meeting at a moment um, when there is a notable increase in this country in strike activity. Uh, right now, there's a strike in, of Hollywood writers and Oakland teachers. 
uh, going on that involves something like 15,000 workers. Um, last fall, 48,000 workers at the University of California. Uh, last month, or the month before, the new school, 9,000 at Rutgers. We're seeing a level of strike contagion that we haven't seen in quite some time. We've seen major strikes in health care. Uh, my own union, CWA, at Catholic Health in Buffalo in 2016, the Nisner strikes at Sinai in Montefiore, uh, the threatened strike in Kaiser in, in 2021. COVID was devastating to health care workers and intensified the staffing crisis that plagued nurses for decades and forced uh, a lot of nurses to take that step of going on strike. COVID also drove a wave of smaller but still significant strikes among lots of other workers, including fast food workers, particularly in California, where there were approximately 100 bona fide strikes, ranging in length from a couple of days up to four weeks. The energy behind those strikes is going into a battle to win a modified form of, select, of sectoral bargaining for over half a million fast food workers in the state of California, um, and there's tremendous potential there. Um, and of course, we're all kind of waiting with bated breath to see what happens this summer uh, when we are facing potential strikes at the nation's largest private sector employer, UPS, and at the big three. I would argue that this strike activity signifies that we are finally emerging from the long, cold winter of post-PATCO strike breaking, a time span of 40 years where strikes declined by 95 percent. We could argue about when this new period began. Personally, I would be partial to the 2011 strike in Verizon or a 2016 strike. But I think you can probably make a better argument. Uh, the Chicago teacher strike in 2012, which led directly to the Red for Ed strikes in 18 and 19, a number of other important teacher strikes, like those in LA, uh, the Twin Cities in Sacramento, clearly in higher ed, in public education and healthcare, industries which can't relocate and which are subject to significant political pressure, uh, there is a newfound militancy. And of course, we're seeing renewed militancy in retail at Starbucks, and we're starting to see it in manufacturing uh, at John Deere. This is great news. Like, this is exciting. Um, but we do need to keep it in perspective. We were all thrilled by Striketober in the fall of 2021. But when we got to the end of that year, there had been a total of 16 large strikes involving 81,000 workers. In 2022, even with all the major strikes I mentioned, there were a total of 23 large strikes involving just under 121,000 workers. Even if you choose to use the Cornell ILR strike tracker, which includes smaller strikes, people may know that BLS stopped counting small strikes in 1981 as a part of the way of erasing strikes. Uh, Cornell says 224,000 workers were involved. By comparison, in every year from 1947 to 1980, there were an average of 300 large strikes involving just under 1.5 million workers every single year. As recently as 1974, there were over 400 strikes involving nearly 2 million workers. And that's to say nothing of the real strike, year, strike waves in American history, like 1937 or 1946, or the greatest of them all, 1919, when over 4 million workers struck, which con constituted at that time 22.5% of the entire workforce, which would be the equivalent of 36 million workers going on strike today. So 224,000, 36 million, that's a pretty big gap. Um, so yes, we should be encouraged by the current upsurge, but we cannot underestimate the magnitude of what capital achieved in the post-PATCO era that stretched from August 3rd, 1981, until whenever you choose to date the revival of strikes. For 40 years, management struck fear into the hearts of American workers and literally extinguished the collective memory of successful striking. As labor lawyer and, Tom, and author Tom Gagan quipped in 1991, since the 80s, it has been insane to go on strike. Every strike ends in disaster. So the question is, what will it take to, revi to revive the strike? What will, it make, what will make it possible to recreate the militancy that was common in the U.S. working class almost continuously from the post-Civil War era of rapid industrialization and the emergence 
of the modern, uh, modern industries like automobile, steel, rubber, et cetera. That would help. People would be less frightened about going on strike. Um, there are no easy answers to this question. Anyone who suggests they have a magic key to unlock the gates of militancy or think the problem comes down to the simple matter of exhorting the labor movement or the labor leadership to do better is, in my opinion, simplifying a very complex and difficult challenge. What I want to do here is more modest. Um, I think it's useful, as Carlos did, to kind of look at the experience of our own unions, of the CWA, um, which I was fortunate enough to work for over the last 36 years and continue to strike all through this post-PATCO period and ask ourselves, or I want to ask, what was the combination of cultural, political, industrial, historical factors that made it possible for CWA telecommunications workers in the Northeast to strike six times in the last 37 years uh, for uh, strikes as long as from two and a half days to 17 weeks, and maybe we can learn some lessons about the challenges and opportunities that will present themselves to trade unionists who are committed to reviving the strike. So let me begin by saying I think the roots of telecommunications workers' willingness and ability to strike begins with a deeply articulated, deeply embedded uh, culture of craft control over the work process. Uh, I interviewed about 15 rank-and-file telephone workers who are now leaders and staff of the union for my master's thesis at SLU. Um, they all described a culture of workers' control that literally could be lifted from the pages of David Montgomery's book about workers' control. Um, they talked about how they, on a day-to-day -day basis, limited output um, and worked together to oppose the boss in the workplace. Uh, just for an example, telephone company Cable Splicers described how a proficient worker could splice 700 to 800 cables in a manhole in an hour, but collectively decided to limit their output to 250 to 300 splices in order to ensure that slower workers didn't look bad. My boss, Dennis Trainer, who was hired at the phone company in like 1968, eventually became the vice president, recalled, we didn't want anyone to get in trouble because they couldn't keep up. We didn't want 800 to be the number when the average person can only do 300. We tried to instill in that person that did the 800 that if you keep on doing that, management was just going to say, well, everyone's got to do more and more. So there was this mentality that is built into the telephone worker's daily experience of collectively fighting against the boss. Um, I have so many great quotes, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to skip over some of them. A second critical factor in sustaining CWA's ability to strike was the implementation uh, in the 1980s of a union-wide program of what we called mobilization, which was the commitment to training and engaging members in the workplace to participate actively in both strike and non-strike contract campaigns. This mobilization program intersected with and reinforced, and I would argue modernized, these traditions of craft control and workplace power that had long been part of the telephone union culture. The mobilization program was the program of Larry Cohen, um, who many of you are aware of as the former president of CWA and now the chair of our revolution. But before that, he led an organizing campaign that brought 40,000 state workers in New Jersey into the union. Uh, he became the New CWA New Jersey area director and then the CWA national organizing director. And in those capacities, he developed and then spread the program of mobilization throughout the union. Not only did this uh, program involve systematically building up and educating um, a network of mobilization coordinators that we considered supplementary to the regular stewards body, but it also meant increasingly the deployment of sophisticated tactics to support the strike, the use of mobile pickets or so-called flying squadrons, uh, enlisting allies in strike support like picketing Verizon wireless stores, paid and earned media tactics, a lot of the things that Carlos talked about in terms of uh, their strategies to make uh, the executives of Marriott go crazy, um, paid and earned media, mass rallies, shareholder actions, political support. For example, when we were on strike in 1989, we got 130 legislators in the state to sign a full-page ad in the Times Union and in the New York Times opposing 9X's application for a rate increase. 
um, got 100,000 customers to sign a petition. Um, we also, uh, three minutes, okay. We also anticipated um, at that time the idea of bargaining for the collective, for the common good. When we went on strike in 89 for health care, our slogan was health care for all, not health cuts at 9x. We were trying to identify our struggle uh, with broader issues. So I would say, in short, the left coming into the union um, through Larry Cohen and a lot of the people he brought with him helped to develop a more developed strike culture of striking um, that for 30 years has gone far beyond just walking on picket lines out of mostly empty central offices. A couple of other important objective factors. Very hard to move our work. You can move the call center, the customer service work, but you can't move the phone network to Singapore. Um, just our sheer numbers, right? In 1989, 60,000 members were on strike, including the IBEW. In 2000, 86,000 people were on strike. In 2016, 36,000. Makes it a lot harder, especially when a big chunk of those workers are skilled, to replace them en masse. And of course, New York is a favorable political climate. This makes us different. After seven weeks, well, it, it, until last year, you could get unemployment insurance. Now you can get it after two weeks if you're a striker. Really unique, gives people a lot more confidence. Finally, and I think this is the most challenging reality that we have to consider when we think about reviving the strike is, it's our history of striking and winning um, that plays a huge part in giving workers the confidence to keep striking. And so this is the most damaging part of what capital accomplished between 1981 and 2012. For CWA in New York, this history goes back to a seven and a half month strike that took place in 1971. It's a long, complicated story. They were out for seven and a half months. They got a dollar a week extra. Seems like they got beat. But by 1974, the big local in New York, in Manhattan, the Bronx, was putting out a button that said, seven more in 74. So there was this sense that was passed down um, from generation to generation that you could fight and win. And as Chris Calabrese, who was formerly the vice president of Local 1109, went on to lead the organizing drive at Cablevision, told me, you had these guys describing how he was brought into the CWA striking culture. You had these guys who were around for the 89 strike who had a lot of pri pride in saying, F you to them. And we kept our health care and we're the only people not paying. You had these two sorts of uh, groups of people who had a ton of pride in those strikes. Then when you came in, as crazy as it sounds, and especially I'm 21, 25 years old, I have no kids, I have no responsibilities, I have a car payment and car insurance and nothing else, you wanted to strike. I want to do that. I want to tell the company to go F themselves. You just couldn't wait because you didn't think about it. Oh, shit, I got to save money. I got a mortgage. I got kids in college. There were so many of us young guys who were hired between 93 and 96 and even up to 98. There were thousands of us, and we were all young, and we all didn't have a lot of attachments. So we couldn't wait for a strike. We were so enthusiastic. We thought all strikes last forever, and it was like, let's go. We got to do what we got to do. There was just so much pride. You had these... You had these neighborhood guys, and everybody was a wise ass. It was a company full of blue collar, high school diploma, GED wise asses who talked to their boss and answered their boss as if they were on the corner. So there was no fear in the work site. There was no fear of management in the work site. The challenge is how do we recreate this sense of history and possibility? And I think it, it's not easy. I think people are going to have to recognize the moment and seize it and begin to rec understand that the political environment is new and different and opportunities exist, but we should not minimize how, how challenging it's going to be. The sociologist uh, Alvin uh, Gouldner wrote a book in, I confess I haven't read it, I found the quote from reading another book, uh, <laughs> called Wildcat Strike in 1955. I did just order it, but... Um, <laughs> And he wrote, and I think quite perceptively, a strike is a social phenomenon of enormous complexity, which in its totality is never susceptible to complete description, let alone complete explanation. My hope here is that some of what we in CWA have learned about this complexity can be used by other unions to build on this moment, to spread strike activity, to win strikes and recreate the history and tradition of striking in this country. It will certainly not be easy 
But there is an opportunity there, and it's incumbent upon all of us to seize that opportunity and make the most of it if we hope to rebuild a democratic, militant, and progressive labor movement. Thanks so much to that fantastic panel. So we're now going to open up for questions. And I'd like to prioritize, if you haven't had a chance to speak yet, uh, we want to call on you first. Um, so let me see if there are any hands. Am I? Wow. OK, I guess that's settled. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, let me wait one more. OK, yeah, Jenny. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, Yanira, I wanted to know if you would have um, some comments on the back and forth between uh, the union and Starbucks around this uh, moronic thing of we're going to bargain store by store and, and how you all have looked at that and what, you know, what are the possibilities there? Okay, let me see if there's a couple other questions and I guess if you don't have, and then we'll take, uh, yeah. Oh my God, it's actually not a question, but uh, there's a, have you noticed the great article about this in the latest New York Review, The Fight for Fair, Fair Wages, which uh, wonderfully discusses five books about union actions lately, and um, it's, I'm just pointing it out, it's just very supportive of what we're talking about here. Thanks. Thank Hi, I'm, I'm Gonzalo Riva. I, I find myself wanting, I don't know if there is a lot of daylight, a lot of difference between um, uh, Bob and Carlos, but I almost want you to duke it out <laughs> on if there are differences. And I, I, I find myself, I want, I want Yadira to be the ref. Because I feel like there is this really interesting case study right now with Starbucks where you were saying there's 300 stores. And I was just doing quick back of the napkin math and thinking, well, there's 9,000 corporate owned stores, 15,000 if you uh, uh, include all the licensed ones. Um, so it's about 2% of all stores in the US, 3% of all the corporate owned stores, which I find myself being this kind of uh, cautious, modest, like, oh, that's not enough. Like, even if you could organize a walkout of all, all 300, will the, board of share the shareholders of Starbucks think this is enough of a threat? Uh, maybe they will, right? I don't know what the threshold is. So I'm interested in how Carlos and Bob would, would think about the, the, the caution of going, going on strike or not in this kind of a context that's more, more vulnerable, retail, all this stuff. And, and you dear what you think w w it would take to sort of get to a threshold of both workers having the confidence to do it and where the company will really hurt and be forced to react, uh, you know, not in eight months' time, but in probably three months' time because they're worried about profits. All right, and then I'm going to take one more uh, from Jimmy. Oh, sorry. And then we'll go over uh, to another round. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I didn't see you. So my question is, um, I'm taking the strikes class with uh, Professor uh, Master, and um, I find theorizing about strikes myself as a form of uh, popular education because I could see myself in it. Um, so I was wondering for the USSW, what does your popular education model look like on the ground? All right, so let's go to our panel, and I'll just pass it down whoever wants to start. Uh, I think, is this on? So the first question was about, in terms of what do we think of, of store by store um, negotiations? Um, okay, louder, okay. <laughs> so as I said before, we have a national bargaining committee and they choose the strategy um, which is set. So this is the way we're doing it now. We're exploring different strategies, but it's basically the decision of the national bargaining committee. Um, you know, they come up with their proposals. We've gone store by store. We have done some regional, but at the end of the day, Starbucks really needs to negotiate, and that's what we have to concentrate on. Anyone else want to take? Do you want to answer the question of what critical mass for a strike? Critical mass for a strike. So we are. We also have a committee that kind of org that organizes and plans strikes, and we've had about three nationwide strikes so far, um, with more than a hundred workers, um, more than a hundred stores going out on strike at one point. What is the threshold? 
um, that's a magical question, right? <laughs> but I think as, as, as we continue to build that muscle to get workers, as they said, it's very intimidating. And as, as you know, CWA said, they had classes, they had different mobilization actions that kind of build that muscle so that it won't be so scary. So that's what we're doing now. We're building workers' power so that as we grow in numbers, 305, as we continue to grow, workers are also willing to take that action. So I was a union bureaucrat for long enough that I would be very, very cautious about offering strategic advice to another union. Um, but I would say that it is a very risky situation, but I'm not sure what the choice is, right? At some point, I think, and I don't know if the number is 300 or 400 or 250 or 500, I think that my view would be the company is vulnerable to a mid-length strike if you can organize enough outside political pressure and consumer pressure on them. You know, and I do think, you know, Mark Meinster said last night, you know, he said, the way he phrased it was, we have to lose more because we're taking more risks. And I do think that if, if a, a national strike of Starbucks workers, if it could be sustained, would become at this moment a major focal point that, you know, it'd be hard to keep the Democrats away from the picket line, you know? So I, I, I think there's possibilities there. Carlton, here's, here's what to weigh in from the HRE perspective. Okay. Um, Good thing Ben's between you. So, uh, <laughs> is, is this on? Yeah, it's on. Um, yeah, I also don't want to tell other folks what to do. Um, I, look, I, I, I think, uh, look, I, I don't want to get too theoretical here, but I'm probably going to, which is, uh, look, I, I think in every campaign I've ever been involved in, um, we have put strikes on the table. We've done all kinds of different versions of striking, some of which have worked and some of which haven't. Everything from the one day walkout where you know you get as much press as you can, you go to city hall, you pass a resolution saying you know the hotel should be you know burned to the ground or whatever it says, um, and to the we're walking out and we're not walking back in again. And and I, I pick those two extremes because they're very different, I think. And I think the risk you're taking in the second one is much much higher, um, both institutionally to the union, uh, organizationally to the workers there, and. Uh, frankly, for the workers who might never get their jobs back, right, in a situation like that. So I, I think there's a real range. Uh, the way we have approached it is, you know, it's always on the table, but the question is, is it really going to help us win? And there's a risk tolerance there, right? And the risk tolerance is really defined, one, by how organized are those workers? Are people really going to go out, right? And two, it's, at least from our perspective, sometimes based on where's the company at. And I'll give a quick example. Like we were very close to going on strike at Bally's Casino just coming out of COVID, but the amount, this is in Rhode Island, the amount of business that was being driven there was very, very, very little. Um, and we ended up with the company nervous proposing a one-year extension, which we took because now we're gonna bargain it when the business has really returned in a significant way. Now that was a strategic decision. The committee voted to do that. But I think there's an example where it may have fallen the other ways. I think it really is a case-by-case -case assessment that matters. But what I would say is if strikes are gonna come back, they absolutely have to be on the table every single time. I really think that matters, so. I thought y'all were gonna duke it out. <laughs> okay, cool, all right. No time. Yeah, um, so yeah, popular education and what it looks like on the ground um, for USSW. I'll just be like really granular and specific and just kind of mention a few things that we do. Uh, one is just the use of social media as a tool, uh, not just to build awareness and to spread news and, and all that, but to, to teach uh, about trade unionism. And so, you know, if you follow our accounts, we have not only, you know, sharing news stories about the union, all that stuff, but, you know, what's the history of the Atlanta washerwoman strike in the late 1800s? What's the history of 
uh, Blair Mountain, what's the history of uh, these key labor struggles in the South? I think that's a, a key pedagogical tactic for us so that there is a pride that can be instilled in Southern worker organizing. That's number one. Number two is we've organized a series of events uh, really around the South, just a kind of rolling series of events uh, that we, uh, we call worker power trainings. In the South, there's this uh, saying, a, a y'all come, like everybody come. We put out the word, try to attract as many low wage workers as possible and, and just do basic um, organizer training, uh, education on trade unionism and, and, and then try to use those as a spring forward into organizing. Number three, we, we utilize, and this is super simple, but just the, the value of retreat. Um, you know, we have a retreat space in, in Durham, North Carolina that we work closely with uh, and, and really make a point out of as often as possible bringing key leaders together to get away for a few days and to, to, to reflect and think about what are we doing. That's, you know, very much in the Highlander tradition. For cultural organizing, you know, using the cultural expressions that the working class has already created to, to build power and to instill meaning. I mean, me and me and, me and Bob's son, who work real close together, we both talk about this all the time. A lot of what sticks low-wage workers into the movement, into the struggle, is building a culture of struggle. And so using culture as a means of power building. And then I think the last thing is, is, is really simple but powerful and, and has been used in, in radical movements through history is exploited and oppressed people telling their story. You know, one of the chants that became popular for us really early on was, you know, this Michael Jackson song, All I all I really know is that they don't really care about us. And that's deeply felt by, by workers. And so I think the ability to, to say I am somebody, to tell your story, is a form of popular education. So that's, that's a few of the, the ways we do it. All right. I uh, didn't call on this side of the room yet. Oh, did you see something there? No. Uh, did I? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, thinking about funding and how the these new forms of unionism get funded, uh, I, I'm curious, uh, you thought, Sarita, specifically, uh, really all of you, about the role of philanthropy and if foundations need to change the way they're acting. Um, is it that important, actually, since unions also have dues-paying members? Um, or does philanthropy need to step up more? Um, okay. Uh, have one back here, and then we're going to move. Is this working? OK, yes. Hi, um, I'm Zara, and I, my question is for Sarita. I'm actually a steward in the Crown Heights Tenants Union, so appreciate the shout out. And was wondering if you could speak more to what you would want to see as the connections between tenant unions and labor unions. All right, and one more right here. Um, ben, you had mentioned. Um, I think three barriers to organizing, but you didn't mention uh, religion, the black belt being also the Bible belt. And, and you did mention Nelson Johnson, so wondering whether, in fact, maybe religion, you know, broadly speaking, could be an opportunity for organizing. All right, let's go ahead and go to our panelists. Sarita, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so on the philanthropy question, um, you know, it's been really interesting journey for me to go from organizing coalitions and people to organizing money, because that's actually what I believe my job is right now, to, to organize resources to actually support movements. I will just say a lot of philanthropic dollars have gone to supporting workers organizing, but outside of the traditional union structures, so worker center, uh, in communities or worker center networks, uh, worker organizations that are forming. So there's been actually an uptick, and I'm really happy to say, I mean, at the Ford Foundation has been supporting uh, worker organizing for over 20 years now. Uh, but what's more important than that is that now there's more partners in philanthropy who are actually supporting workers' rights and economic justice work. And that may seem like no big deal, but I just want to say for years I had to raise money from unions, which is not easy, by the way, <laughs> at all. And I had to raise money from philanthropy. And in philanthropy, 
I was not allowed to use the word union. Like I had to actually write grant proposals and not, I was told by program officers, you cannot say union, right? We have culturally shifted a lot. <laughs> so it, I, it, it, philanthropy isn't static, just like labor, like labor is not monolithic, philanthropy is also not mon monolithic. So to know that there's more of us in philanthropy now who come from organizing backgrounds and are trying to figure out smart ways to actually you know, grow the pool of resources that are supporting worker organizations, and there are many partners in this room that we've supported, and it's important to understand that um, in moments like the economic crisis, that was an organizing opportunity for people like me to get beyond the usual suspects of funders and go to a whole new circle of funders to get them interested. And I actually think whether we like it or not, the federal investments right now um, that are being made has brought a whole new set of foundations that are suddenly interested in this question about workers and what many of us in philanthropy are trying to do is to say it's not just about jobs, it's actually about worker power. And so there is organizing happening within, within philanthropy. Um, and we're gonna continue to support some of the organizing that we see happening you know, um, across the country. So that's, that's what I'll say on that for right now. You have other questions. On the tenants, um, unions and labor unions, you know, one of my most favorite stories of that, and you probably know this, um, one of the workers that we profiled ooh, in the book was Dolores Wright. And Dolores is a leader in the Crown Heights Tenants Union. And Dolores was amazing. We, spent, we talked to her for a while, and it wasn't until the end of her story of talking about being a tenant and deciding to be part of the Crown Heights Tenants Union that we, you know, we said to, you know, we were, we were chatting, we are like, how did you get to this place? And she's like, well, I was a leader in Domestic Workers United. And I organized for the first New York State, you know, Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. And I remember, actually, she looked oddly familiar to me, but I could not place her. But I remember being in Albany with her. And actually, that is a really important part of the story of why I keep stressing the whole person organizing, because Dolores learned from the domestic worker struggle, which, by the way, when Domestic Workers United started, people thought they were crazy. Like, let's be honest, people were super dismissive of the idea that domestic workers could organize. Many people were dismissive, and especially when you talk about a base of mostly women of color, black women, immigrant women, there was a real dismissive or orientation. But she learned through that struggle how to have voice and collective agency, and then she's decided, she literally said to us in the interview, then I decided, well, why can't I do this in the other parts of my life? And hence, she got involved with Crown Heights Tenants Union. So for me, and this links back to the popular education question. Popular education in the way that we're talking about is exactly what needs to happen. But we also, through the storytelling, as Ben was saying, it's really important to understand that people want agency in many different parts of their lives. And the way that you take that story and make the connection really matters. And so my hope with tenants unions and labor unions is that, one, there's a constant cross-pollination and understanding. I mean, I experienced this at JW Jay in the early days when Bob was talking about Larry's work. Larry Cohen was the, the founder of Jobs of Justice. And I remember locally being an organizer in Chicago. And at that time, most unions were not mobilizing their own members, but Jobs of Justice was. And at one point, unions came to me in Chicago and said, who are our members who are you are mobilizing? And we gave them that list. Now, we could laugh about that now, but the truth is those infrastructures are still needed because unions are are not mobilizing your own members, right? So how are institutions like Crown Heights Tenants Unions and other organizations mobilizing members and understanding who in their membership are union members? And then what's the relationship to the union, especially if the union goes on strike or is in a major struggle? That work is more than just hiring somebody who's gonna do coalition work. That is a depth of understanding the connections that people have in their communities and how you leverage that correctly to either win for tenants or to win for the union. Um, ben? 
So yeah, I think the the question of religion and the, I just talked too quiet, huh? The question of religion in the South is a really important one and Keith's the one that really should answer it because he's very, I think, deeply attuned to this. But yeah, the South is the Bible Belt and, and that's both, um, you know, been, the religious tradition of the South, I think, has been used to, um, to oppress and exploit people, but I think has also been um, a liberatory mechanism for, for working class people in the South, especially black workers. And, and so there's a deeply ingrained history of um, religion being intertwined with social struggle, obviously, we all know that. But I think, you know, I have been guilty of this in the past, and I think many, many um, labor organizers are guilty of this. Oftentimes we think, what that means is, oh, we need to get a pastor to come to the rally and talk, and that's like the faith voice. And that's, we should do that, that's a good thing to do. But I, I think what is even more important is to have a deep understanding, and I'm specifically talking about our experience in the South of, you know, what, what we call the beloved community. Like, what is this religious notion of the beloved community? I think it's actually exactly what we're fighting for in the union. And, you know, secondly, Specifically, I speak of you know the black experience in the South, that the, the churches have been a form of organization when organization has been denied at every other level. And so, you know, we've worked really deeply um, with churches all across the South, people like Reverend Johnson, people like Reverend Barber, um, you know, the AME Zion Church in South Carolina has been a critical site of struggle. Um, so I think it's, it's really important. Uh, we have some time left. Is there anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask any question yet today? Yeah. There's two here, yeah. Hey, thanks guys. Um, <clears throat> curious, there's a lot of different ways that the strikes can be used, right? The strikes, and I think Carlos talked a lot about this, of like there's like the one day strikes and then you run to the city hall and get the resolution. There's pulling you know, hundreds or thousands of workers out for a mid-league strike where you might not, to break a company where you might not have an end goal. What I see right now, and I spent, the first half of my career feeling like no one in this country wanted a union and it was like trying to <laughs> create water from a stone. But now I see a lot of activity among a range of workers that are doing stuff, you know, spontaneously, right? And I'm wondering what are ways that we can use sort of that energy and that militancy as institutions in the union movement to actually change the DNA in some of our unions? And that just seems to be a disconnect. And obviously there's contradictions involved in that. I think the Starbucks campaign has, you know, gone in a couple of different directions. One would say, you know, a big union's trying to do that, but also maybe directing that militancy in the wrong direction, right? So what are some strategies to sort of harness this moment? Because, you know, E.B. Thompson talks about this, right? Like, you know, social movements last, you know, six years, and you've got six years to try to figure out how to institutionalize some of that. And I'm wondering if, we can do more in this moment to harness that and actually capture that some of that energy. So like the Starbucks campaign isn't something that, you know, in 10 years, a 30 year old barista talks about is this like really fun thing they did when they were 20, but like they don't have a union now and like we don't have unions with low wage workers at all, right? Hi. Um I'm Yubin, I'm a grad student. I have two questions actually. Uh, my first question is um, about uh, contract, um, contract strike versus a union recognition strike and if there is different strategies uh, for those. Um, and my second question is about, uh, someone mentioned about, uh, bargaining for the collective good and I'm wondering um, when th that strategy has been used and when that hasn't been used um, and when might be a good time? Is it just for a consumer campaign or are there other um, uses to that? And if anyone has experience when that was considered but not really taken up, that'd be uh, interesting to note. Thank you. All right, and we're, I'm gonna let uh, Mark, who's been working all day, ask. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask <laughs> about questions of workers' control of production, right? We. We heard from about the need for agency or about at Amazon, about the demands for dignity and respect. But I really think that it's out of the repertoire of most unions to think about these questions. They just think about money. And therefore, it, it, I think it's out of the, the range of experience of workers themselves about 
what they can fight for, and I wish it was not. All right, and I think we could take a few extra minutes because we started late, but I'm going to let all of you just take a chance to uh, take a moment to answer which of those questions you'd like and, uh, or just to have closing comments. So uh, who would like to go first? Um, all right, so I have a – those are great questions. Uh, number one, on that question. Uh, I'm super open to suggestions um, because I think we're trying to figure this out, right? Because I do think it is a moment to be bold and to be really risky. Um, I think one of the challenges we faced in the hospitality industry, partic particularly coming through COVID, has been um, a lot of folks angry but also freaked out at the same time, right? And so it's how do you harness anger and fear that's kind of happening simultaneously, something we're really trying to think about. But I am really open to lots of ideas. We have, um, you know, at least in my local, we've put a lot of resources into this question. One place we have had some real success is on university campuses, both in terms of organizing and contract bargaining. Uh, we also had, you know, fraternities and sororities backing us up at Northeastern, um, but also you know, at uh, a number of other places where we are organizing that I cannot talk about publicly. We have a lot of students who historically have been the laggards, right? We've gotten the workers organized first and then students come piling in at the end. We've had students coming to us saying, hey, I wanna organize, oh, and can I figure out how to organize my coworkers, which is really cool. So um, that's one place I've seen it that I think is really interesting. On the question of recognition versus uh, contract bargaining, look, I think they're both really, really, really powerful. Um, we have definitely tried both. We've done a lot more of the contract bargaining strike. Uh, I think one of the big challenges with recognitional strikes, and I would leave this to the legal experts in the room, but there are significant legal obstacles to open-ended recognitional strikes where you are not replaced and eventually voted out as the union, um, which may be in the categories of things that should change soon right at the national level because we certainly we have tr we've done very short duration ones they have been somewhat effective but I would certainly like to try you walk out until you're recognized I think it's a great idea um, uh, quickly on the last two things on the collective good question um, I think it is really really important and in fact in a number of our strikes collective good issues have been at the center. I'll just pick on one. In the Marriott strike, which came right in the middle of the Me Too movement, uh, employee safety was one of the core demands. Um, actually, that demand and technology, and AI technological change demands were the last two things settled at the bargaining table after we had settled the economics of the contract, right? Uh, those were real issues for our members. Those were not just things that we as the union decided, oh, this is good, it's in the newspaper, like let's go, uh, you know, hospitality industry, employee safety, sexual harassment, a massive crisis in the industry continues to be. We fought for it, we have, we can bar guests from hotels if they are accused of sexual harassment. That was the big win in the, the and then, Finally, I'll say just on the production question, I, I do think that's really important. And uh, I think it maybe tries to get to something I was trying to say earlier. One of the biggest challenges we face when we do go on strike is that the hotels and the universities, frankly, stay open and it gets at this question for people. Um, and so I think trying to resolve that question and figure out how to organize folks on how to think about production is really, really important going forward. So. Um, I felt like my friend Carlos here answered those questions <laughs> really well. So I'm going to go more to sort of closing, I think, comments. Um, so one is just that um, Ben talked about beloved community, which is great. And I love Reverend Johnson, uh, Nelson Johnson. Um, and I just wanted to lift up and sharpen this point about values and the importance of people feeling a sense of shared values my experience in the labor movement, and rightfully so, has often when we've talked about workers, worker power and taking action, it's always been the how, like how do we do it, which we need to figure out, right? How do we do it more effectively? How do we do it at scale, et cetera? But sometimes we leave the conversation about the why 
out of the conversation. So then people actually do not see themselves in the story of the labor movement. And so, a great example of this, and it's another, it was one that, another profile we did in the book, we, we interviewed two leaders in the West Virginia um, teachers uh, stop, the work stoppage. And actually, I, I skipped over this in my presentation about the maps, but just to say sometimes when we think about where possibility, where there's possibility, we often look to the electoral maps as if they're the maps that will tell us. But often, that's actually not the only source of power. So we have to look at where there's, what's the relationship of place to 20th century bargaining. And so we talk about this in the book a bunch, but I say this because in the South, in West Virginia, one would assume that where the worker stoppage happened was in the blue counties where most of the progressives reside. But what we learned was actually the strike started in the conservative red counties in the southern part of the state. And they were so outraged by what was happening and they connected around a broader set of shared values that actually mobilized them into action. I just share that story because I think values is really important here. Like we sort of talk about dignity or we talk about agency and voice, but it actually really matters. And so how we craft our campaigns in a way and tell that story differently to the public as well as the workers themselves actually matters right now, especially while we have sort of high interest in unions. So just wanted to make that point. The last is that there's, it's amazing that there are workers across the economy who are organizing and taking collective action right now. And again, how do we learn to tell that story differently? Like, do you know how many young people were excited about the minor league baseball players? It was a big deal in a lot of circles of young people of color. Or how many young girls, who are soccer players were excited about the women's. My own daughter, I used to coach her team, ran onto the field and said, did you know that soccer players, women's soccer players don't get paid the same as men? Meanwhile, I've worked in the labor movement my whole life and she could care less about the fact that I've talked about this. But that was the moment that captured her attention. So how do we, as especially as we're preparing for these major strikes, as we're preparing for these major campaigns, how are we also listening to where the hearts and minds are of the public and people right now in a way that allows us to, to add to the power that we're building. And I just worry that sometimes we, we treat that as it's just strategic messaging. It's not strategic messaging. It's about a culture change strategy. And we're in the middle of a massive culture change and shift. And shame on us if we don't figure out how to actually channel that in really smart and thoughtful ways for generations to come. Thank you. Yeah, then we'll, if we can wrap it up on uh, or quickly, more quickly. Okay. I'll be I'll be real quick. I'll just. I know. I should have said that to Ben because he's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll just be. I'll I'll respond to uh, Wes's deeply philosophical question really really quick. Um, you know, we're in this movement moment. Um, I think E.P. Thompson is right. Movements, you know, tend to last around six years. That history bears that out. And there's a tension between movement and institution always. And I think. It's incumbent on all of us who are trying to build this movement, and, and it's a very widespread and, and diverse movement, to think 10, 20, 30 years down the road, and how do we build the kind of formations that can keep, if not keep the movement as strong as it is today forever, because that just honestly doesn't generally happen. How do, how do the embers of the movement continue burning within the formations that we build? And I think that's a really important task for the long-term health of the labor movement. Uh, quickly on, on a bunch of these questions, I mean, Wes, I think to your question, um, I mean, you're looking at here at a bunch of the unions that are trying to take advantage of this moment, right? And I think there's a huge challenge in the labor movement about how much leadership there is that's willing to take some risks and ex experiment with new forms of, of organizing like a lot of what you're seeing up here, right? And so no simple answer. 
I don't think that the E.P. Thompson formulation is a scientific. So I think maybe we have a little bit more than six years, and it depends when you date the beginning of the movement from. I think we're in the Occupy Bernie moment, and I think it's going to last for a while. Um, so I think we have some more opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Um, as far as bargaining for the common good, I mean, I, I think it's a really important strategy to reposition the labor movement uh, to uh, be more in alignment with the general needs of the working class as opposed to just the narrow needs. And, and the narrow needs are what pays our dues. So, you know, we can't ignore those. And we certainly don't. I do think, you know, in education and health care, it's you know, it's a no-brainer. When we went on strike at Catholic Health in, in 2021, it was all about safe patient staffing, right, which is a common good demand, right? So I, th I think we need to explore that as much as possible. Um, and Mark, I think, you know, in answer to your question, I wasn't making the point, I wasn't making that a prescriptive uh, recommendation that everybody should feel workers' power in the job. What I was saying was, this is what contributed to the sense of power that telephone workers have. And in fact, what I was implying was it's a little worrisome to think about how other workers experience that sense of power. And so it's, you know, it's a challenge, I think. So I just want to just bring out the point again about the importance of getting a contract within the first year. And so that is crucial. So I think that's one of the major things we need to continue to explore and figure out how do we really get a contract before the first year. And in terms of, you know, I, in terms of there's the, some of the common themes were obvious, yes, agency, respect, um, communities, right? Bargaining for the common good is it's about the community. So all those things need to continue to happen and continue to explore. But it will put the workers that have voted for their for their for their union will put them in a much greater sense of power once they're able to have that contract. Once they're able to come out on lost time and then that will give give the other things a little make it a little bit more easier as um, was saying that experience with the domestic alliance was able to open up a whole other world and that's what we have to make sure because we know that once folks have that experience they organize everything around them and so we got to make sure we continue to do that and make it easier <laughs> all right thank you so much all right thank you to our panelists that was fantastic and we're gonna have a break and see you back at 315. Oh, hey. <laughs>